Registered Phenomena Code 661 Previous Code LA-020 Object Class Gamma Orange Hazard Types Destabilization Extradimensional Temporal Mind Control Immeasurable Containment Protocols An on-site detachment, comprised of no less than five ASF personnel, is to be stationed outside of RPC-661 in a temporary housing location. They are to patrol the main structure and the adjacent grounds hourly for non-authorized persons, and must also restrict access to the site through primarily non-violent means. ASF personnel are to be equipped with stun guns and a supply of Class A-1 amnestics. All roads that lead to RPC-661 are to be barricaded, and a two-meter tall fence is to be maintained around the property. In addition, all research teams permitted within RPC-661 must be checked for signs of fatigue or exhaustion prior to entry. Medical staff are to issue transdermal stimulant patches capable of administering up to 200 mg of caffeine to anyone exhibiting these signs. Personnel are not permitted to be alone, lay down, or sit down for an extended period of time while in the main structure of RPC-661. Personnel are not permitted under any circumstances outside of testing to sleep inside RPC-661. Researchers with 2R clearance and above are freely permitted in the RPC-661 to study its minor reality coherency fluctuations. The FOA, MI-13, and UNAAC are to be given Level 0 affiliation clearance when jointly studying the area's minor anomalous traits. The Boons of Cult of Tablung is charged with the investigation, containment, and illumination of anomalous objects, persons, entities, and organizations that threaten the German nation and its people. Military Intelligence Section 13 is the security and protection of Great Britain and British overseas territories against anomalies of all kinds. United Nations Anomalous Activities Committee, the global regulatory body for official anomalous agencies such as the Authority, MI-13, FOA, and other such agencies. All personnel are to vacate RPC-661 from 2000 hours to 0800 CET pending Director Mason's approval for testing. Uniform 01, XD-N01 Exploration Specifications and Briefing RPC-661 XD-N01 Exploration Protocols Uniform 01 operatives chosen to reconnoiter XD-N01 are to be stationed inside the lower subsections of RPC-661 proper during the hours of 2100 to 0700 CET. Once in place, research personnel will administer an injection of 30-70 mg sodium thiopental, with a 0.5 mg per kilogram of 100 ml saline per minute, until the agents are mildly anesthetized. Mild anesthetization has been categorized in this case as a semi-lucid state, in which operatives can still respond to stimuli. An additional injection of 15 to 40 mg may be used intermittently throughout an expedition to maintain anesthesia. Simultaneously, the agents will be instructed to apply four drops of neoptisin to each eye. Additional dosages of neoptisin must be applied by research personnel post-anesthetization if anoptisin levels normalize. Due to the nature of XDN01's possible mimetic effects, Uniform 01 operatives must concurrently transcribe their findings during their expedition. Operatives are not permitted to interact directly with any entity encountered with an XDN01. Furthermore, Uniform 01 agents must actively avoid the following actions. Attempt to read any form of written language. Think about your baseline body in any way. Act independently of given instructions or without purpose. Reside with an XDN01 for more than four hours at a time. Close your eyes. Warning: Uniform 01 agents subjected to XDN01 and neoptisin are to remain under observational study 48 hours post-expedition. Research personnel are to document all medical and behavior abnormalities during this time. To date, they have documented migraines due to swelling of the stem and cortex of the brain. Excessive forgetfulness, 
predominantly to memories associated with XD-01. Some research staff believe this may be due to an antimimetic effect XD-01 has on those who traverse it. However, it may be related to the nature in which the Authority travels in and through XD-01. Minor to Severe Somniphobia Somniphobia is the fear of falling asleep. It is often caused by intense nightmares or sleep paralysis. Enucleation of the Eyes or Oedipism A form of self-mutilation of the eye, often caused by psychosis or paranoid illusions. Cases of Oedipism related to RPC-661 have all been by agents eviscerating the inner contents of the eye. The method in which these agents have learned to perform such a procedure is currently unknown. Post-Incident 66101-N01, X-Ray 06 and nullifiers, Archer Monitor worldwide reports of SADs and SIDs for possible connections to RPC-661. Sudden Arrhythmic Death Syndrome and Sudden Infant Death Syndrome are both unexplained conditions of which a subject dies in their sleep. These deaths often have no specific cause. The size and scope of RPC-661's ability to affect an individual's subconscious are currently unknown. Presently, XD-N01 and RPC-661 are pending reclassification to Omega. RPC-661 is the designation given to the abandoned Schwarzwald Academy located near Germany. The school, which ran from 1750 to 1897 was regarded as a prestigious academic and religious institution while in its prime. It served mostly the Prussian aristocracy, with a curriculum focused primarily on Lutheranism, philosophy and other Prussian ideals. However, in 1873, prominent occultist Abner Stur took over as the Academy's Grandmaster. Stur was believed to be heavily associated with several unnamed Nihil cults and more predominantly the Omega Iota Society of 1859. He was later ostracized from the latter group for unknown reasons. From this point on, little is known about what happened at the Academy until its suspected destruction and subsequent closure in 1897. During Stur's reign, several notable figures had either disappeared from the grounds or left the school due to reports of possible witchcraft. See Addendum 661-01. On October 1897, local sources claim that the Swatswald Academy had burned down in the night, killing the entire student body and staff. Despite these allegations, which were probable cover stories formulated by either the Stir or an unknown third party, the site was rediscovered in pristine condition by early FOA agents, following up on rumors of a haunted mansion in the woods in 1912. After initially being unable to find a source of the spatial anomalies within, the FOA formally turned the site over to the Authority in 1948. RPC-661 of the anomalous traits manifest solely inside the main Swatswald building. Minor reality coherency fluctuations appear randomly throughout the site. These fluctuations manifest as a drop in coherency no greater than minus 1.0 on the Anderson coherency scale. Researchers have noted that these fluctuations appear as fuzzy and distorted dim lights. Due to the relatively safe nature of these reality inconsistencies, the Authority and its allies have used the site as a means to familiarize new researchers with reality-based anomalies. Addendum 661-01 RPC Reclassification During a routine joint research expedition in 1957, Several researchers were observing a minor spatial distortion when the floor of the Grand Lecture Hall collapsed. Beneath the structure, an even larger subterranean chamber was discovered. This subcathedral was adorned with several banners depicting the nine defic sons of the Nihil religion. The Children of Nihil is a religious collective that reveres the cleansing nature of floods and believes that through metamorphic trials and natural disasters, they can create a society that more aptly prolongs the values of their mentally disordered followers. Pillars of pure unmarked copper stood in each corner of the room, marking the four cardinal points. Additionally, all the stairwells and halls leading to this chamber have been bricked shut or purposely collapsed. Inside the room, 
researchers uncovered 364 corpses strapped to various pews and chairs. These remains, designated RPC-661-1-364, appear to be organized in no discernible pattern. Each corpse dons a formal version of the school scholarly robe, alongside a copper cage fixed to their heads by the use of a single nail driven through each temple. Researchers were able to cross-reference and identify several bodies to various students who attended Swatswald at the time of its closure. Despite having died in 1897, none of the bodies have shown any signs of decomposition. Autopsies performed on the remains have yet to yield any identifiable cause of death. Parallel to the main underground chapel, personnel discovered a small secondary chamber. The body of Grandmaster Stir alongside several books and journals detailing the activities of the Academy staff, were discovered in what was believed to be a sacristy, also referred to as a vestry. A sacristy is a room within a church used for keeping various records and sacred vestments. These journals contain extensive records on the Apoptosites, a previously unknown secret society believed to be an offshoot of the Children of Nihil base reliefs and early Omega Iota society ideals. Based on the fundamental teachings of the Apoptosites and Stir's previous affiliations, Authority personnel have theorized this group is an entirely new subcult formed by him. Throughout Grandmaster Stir's incumbency, students became indoctrinated to worship the solar deities and various other entities. Referred to as Grand Civil Empadoc in all recovered religious texts, Several other possible references to Empedoc have been recorded by the Authority, ranging from 400 BC to 1800 BCE. The journals detail acts of pedophilia performed by the staff, and ritualistic sacrifices perpetrated among the students. According to recovered text, Stir influenced both the staff and student body to perpetuate these increasingly violent and debaucherous acts as a form of ceremonial corruption. This was done as a precursor to Apoptosite's ultimate goal, performing the Rite of Communion. Additional information on the Rite could not be located among the recovered records and scriptures. Stir's body, designated RPC-661-365, similarly showed no signs of decomposition. The corpse was originally discovered maintaining orthostasis, with both arms raised laterally 90 degrees with the palms facing downwards. Any attempts to move RPC-661-365 have been met with resistance by an unseen force. Upon closer inspection of the remains, researchers discovered scars on the base of the neck and upper cranium conducted the early forms of brain surgery. Several symbols built from copper were screwed in place beneath the skull. These symbols include various Hebrew-derived letters and a series of eye insignias placed throughout the telencephalon of the brain. The telencephalon is the highly developed anterior section of the forebrain. It consists mainly of both cerebral hemispheres. Addendum 661-02 XDN01 Discovery and Exploration Due to extensive analysis of the recovered text found within RPC-661, the departments of Theistic, Viteric, and Kabbalic studies began to theorize about the correlation between RPC-661-1 through Dash 365 and the minor spatial anomalies found throughout the site. Specific texts refer to quote, the section of the mind behind the eye and wall, unquote, which was quote, brought forth from the rite of communion to grant true sight. Unquote. This locale was later just simply named Unbektif by the members of Apotasy. Inscribed below is an excerpt taken from Grandmaster Stir's 13th Book of Scripture. Sleep in the Master's house, he who has given you eyes and dominated you, so that you may dominate others. He who will rest among the sky next to you, brothers and sisters. Now sleep, close your eyes so that you may see. Cross the deep cold ocean into our unbektif, our promised land. Now sleep in the Master's house, close your eyes so that you may see. Grand Sybil Impidoc Following the instructions referenced above and throughout the various works, researchers began to discover shared dreamlike visions between unconscious persons within RPC-661. 
These visions were noted to grow in strength and intensity, based on an individual's location inside the site. Following this discovery, Uniform-01 was tasked with the exploration of the Universal Dream, now reclassified as RPC-661-XD-N01. Office of Anomaly Experimentation 661.1 Department Research Date July 27, 19 Subject RPC-661 Authorization 2C and 2R Staff Dr. Hansik Dr. Meridak Agent Buong Test Purpose Agent Buong has been tasked with testing research personnel's new method for semi-cognitive entry into XD-N01. Once entry can be verified, Agent Buong must then actively transcribe the details of her surroundings. Begin Log Wet. The ground feels wet. I'm standing on a pier, stretching to my sides, and in front of me deep fog. Everything's wet, but there is no water anywhere near me. Behind, there is a dried, empty ocean. It is pure black with small streaks of blue, like lighting against a blackboard. This world is fuzzy. There's not enough detail where it should be. I look deeper into the fog and see a city skyline off in the distance. It looks like it could be a mile or two. I'll start heading there. Approximately thirteen seconds pass. I've made it to the city. It's huge with rooftops above and below the ground I stand on. Every corner is above one section, and below each there is another. Still farther off, I see the bell tower of Swatswald. It's bent and twisted to the side as if its neck has creased to stare at me through its window. Its eyes will not blink. His gaze penetrates the fog with unseen tangible emotion. I can't stand to look at it. The sky is full of stars, shifting and turning with the speeding clouds. The longer I look, the more faces and hands there are among the stars, shrill screaming growing louder. But as soon as I look away, they're gone, and the quiet returns. The tower is looking up like me, and the fog clears right above it. I see a black sun through the hole in the sky. An outer ring of bright fire burns around the corpse trickling somewhere beyond my sightline. An unnatural breeze can be felt, constant yet forceful. The wind sways back and forth in opposite directions. Two armies giving way to each other at the ticks of a clock. The city appears to be a mixture of Victorian and Gothic stylings, with no discernible end. Buildings like cathedrals and chapels sprout up in odd, hurtful angles. They are occupied solely by light and smoke spilling from chimneys and windows and blotting the shifting sky. Each window I look through, though, has no correlation to its outside, with its contents and orientations as erratic as the city itself. Each window is lying to me. They have no reflection, and I can't be seen. I am not alone on these streets. Shadows of shadows stalk me just out of sight. The windows have shown me where to look. I can't help but think of my reflect. End log. Mission status. Success. Immediately follow Agent Wong's recognition of her baseline self. A minus 1.5 drop in reality coherency was observed around the testing area as she returned to full consciousness. Dr. Meridak believes the coherency drop could be due to the sudden attempted reunification of the subconscious and conscious minds while on XD-N01. Containment protocols have been updated to reflect these findings. Office of Anomaly Experimentation 661.2 Department Research Date July 31, 19 Subject XD-N01 The subject classification was changed following Expedition 661.1's success and proven the existence of a shared conscious space. Authorization 2C and 2R Staff Dr. Isaac Dr. Merodak Dr. Buong Test Purpose Agent Buong must attempt to make contact with RPC-661-1 through Dash-364 instances, believed to reside in XD-N01. Secondarily, the agent must ascertain the dangers posed by the various other entities in the dream space. Begin Log
<gasps> the air is rotten, old and putrescent. The atmosphere is thick. I can barely find my way through the miasma. A small fillet of light passes through a nearby window, revealing the outline of a building. As I make my way out of the structure, I realize it's a barn, worn by age yet standing. An antique, far past its prime with stacks of rancid grain leaking from its seams. My sight rises, and before me I see a titan. It rears its head against the precarious sky, posing in the shape of a city. The unnerving horizon, broken by the outlines of buildings too tall to stand, is populated by a growing discord of lights and sounds. Swatswald, yet again, stand above its peers. The corpse sun sits directly above the prolific structure, perhaps locked in place, enshrined by death. I am just on its edge, in between the woods and the arterial alleyways of the city. A lone willow looms, isolated against its siblings. Each branch reaches down around the neck of a boy, clad in robes and cages. Bodies sway slowly to the breathing beat, unmoving. Their eyes are unblinking, fixated on me, a hundred little mirrors beaming through an unstable sea. Their chests become blotched in abstract paintings, unfinished drawings, sketches, and blank pages the lower I look. I'm calling out to them, but my voice drowns in the heavy air. Filthy apostates. Still, the ones that are able to move point to the tower. A heavy gaze contorts its way from above, a crushing presence against my eyes. It looms over, his eyes seeing from the tower. On the streets again, they pulsate in a curious syncopation with the breeze. A sickening wet thud adds to the cacophony, over and over again. Rhythmic yet disordered. Soft and damp accompanied by scraping metal and a dull pounding. Whispers, low and rushed, echoes in an unnatural sense. A man, lowly and terrified, is mumbling as if to himself. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of… whose gift is this? The wages of sin is death, undeath. It is death. No. No, no, that can't be right. Faith in the Ilum is the gift. I see him now. He is just a young man, facing away from me, a member of the academy, kneeling in front of a twisted lamppost. Age of Buong pauses for several seconds. He is ramming his head against the broken iron of the post. Every plunge goes all the way through his skull and collides with the cage still fixed to his head, metal screeching in uncaring apathy. Each joust ever as forceful than the last, never breaking stride in his barely coherent ramblings. I'm calling out to him, but he doesn't appear to be able to hear me or have the wherewithal to answer. The noise won't stop, and the veil of silence keeps crumbling. The commotion is beginning to draw a crowd. A group of beasts speed past me, their porcelain figures creating a white blur. The method of their movements is unsettling to my eyes. A man in robes carrying a two-string guitar beckons me over. His face is obscured in shadow covered by a helm fashioned from a bull's skull. As quickly as he appeared he vanishes, leaving behind three queens, one old, one beautiful, and one child walking forward in a circular pattern around me. They distort rapidly beyond recognition, before ascending towards a shimmering moon beyond the woods. Several other vaguely familiar faces shoot past me, undoubtedly members of the academy. Every one of them ignores my calls. In their hands, they hold all manners of viscera, like worker ants or drones, they move hurriedly with great purpose, down alleyways and at impossible angles beyond my comprehension to see. One of the immense beasts stops to observe the murmuring student. Its sweeping spindly frame encapsulates the scene and blocks my sight, not unlike a snake encircling its meal. Its jaws quickly snap and I hear bones crack. The boy continues to mumble through his now torn neck, uncaring still. An awful gurgling overpowers the sounds of the busy street as he refuses to be silenced. The beast snaps down again, severing the boy in two at the torso. The gutter swells in bloody black ichor, enveloping the two. The entirety of the scene is washed away by coming tides, and I am alone again. The breeze grows in both strength and the frequency of its syncopations. The tower stares at me once more. It understands he sees. End log.
Mission Status Success Dr. Merodak concluded testing after 4 hours and 23 minutes of exploration. Based on additional reviews of the documentation, research personnel have begun to correlate some of the entities observed with an XD N01 with otherworldly and extradimensional beings documented in baseline reality. However, the lethality of the denizens of XD N01 remains inconclusive. Further testing with CSD personnel is being considered. Additionally, Agent Buang's review of the document has led to a curious discovery. Several uses of archaic terminology used by the agent throughout the log were unknown to her prior to entry. This may be due to a subconscious bleed-through effect directly proportional to time spent inside the dream space. Containment protocols have been updated to reflect these findings. Office of Anomaly Experimentation 661.3 Department Research Date August 3, 19 Subject XD-N01 Authorization 3C and 3R Staff Dr. Isaac Dr. Merodak Agent Buong Test Purpose Agent Buong has been tasked with exploring the diverse structures inside XD-N01. Primarily, she must attempt to reach the Swatswald School Building and identify any additional structures with similar counterparts found within baseline reality. Begin Log The whispers of the dream fill my head, and a restful peace overtakes my body. The lifeless woods welcome me with a gentle rustling of dead branches. Eternal night blurs my vision again. The ageless fog distorts the world around me, pushing me like a branch in the river's current towards the city. Intangible forces draw me to its gaze. Cautiously I enter the city. Memories of the pale beast and the boy makes me shudder. I feel as though my thoughts are not my own now. Memories make my mind a meal, a dinner bell to the watchers, and soon I see the beast. Parasites in our holy land, looking to pilfer our feast. Who said that? I feel as though my thoughts are not my own now. The bull-faced man passes by, accompanied by another, one in a black suit. Their odd presence recenters me. As I make my way towards the deific center, the guiding lamppost shifts colors, warming the darkness and making it dance. A soft cardinal flame grips my consciousness. It lights my way towards a sunken abbey, between and beneath. The street is devoid of life, a faint silence foreshadowing her fate. As I enter, a warm reception of beautiful architecture greets me, far more beautiful than the wearisome outside. A grand library filled beyond my senses with copper and gold statues. Several floors extend above the entrance, far more than could be seen from the outside. Another lie. A colossal well marks the center of the foyer, adorned in a mound of corpses made of flesh and black stone. Its decaying structure contradicts the rest of the elaborate scene, faceless and unnamed. The busts and statues draw me closer with their alluring oddities each angle and turn, bending into itself and outward. The central column rests on the back of vaguely human effigies. Their various appendages wrap around the supports, as if they were not sufficient and needed to hold the building themselves. Their arms, wings, and legs are embellished with black diamond eyes that trace my every movement. I walk deeper into a fathomless hole made itself manifest through the archive, and their features twist until they are nothing more than spheres and circles. Still accentuated by wings and eyes, but wholly alien in form. Despite the deafening silence, I can hear that I am not alone here. The books embedded between the bricks tempt me to open them. They beg and scream, their presence different from that of his gaze through the tower, but not entirely foreign. The spine of each book is devoid of any identifiable markings or descriptors, instead populated with biting eyes. I grab a large red book from one of the lower rungs of the bookcase. Each page is full of unintelligible scribbles. My eyes begin to throb with aggressive anguish as I struggle to piece together the writing. Suddenly, the markings take on a life of their own and begin to form a word. Not one that I can read, but one that transcends the page into the peripherals of my understanding. Hello? It says to me. The hair on the back of my neck stands on end at the intrusion of the word. Run, you fool. I slam the book shut and make my way towards the main door of the library. 
Sounds of rushing water drown out my footsteps. From outside the building, the tide comes yet again. The presence I felt inside the book flees from its rising ichor. The purging well breaks the torrent of the flood and provides me a brief respite. The abbey is gone. Its remains, the books, bust and stone, are strewn about the streets. The blood of the dream, the students, gather among the rubble. Suddenly they cull the fleshy brick and stone and scurry off again, living blood opposite to that of the tree. As before, they ignore my attempts to call them. However, while I stand close to them, I see their minds. A cosmos in the eye of all of us. We are connected. They see me now, too. He sees me now. I know I am a small piece inside a great beast, unable to feel my tiny movements or perhaps apathetic to them, but now I feel its hunger, unending craving. The author of this world pangs of hunger. Dr. Meridak notes an elevated heart rate and an increase in REM sleep effects. I turn to see him, behind me, completely aware of my existence, through the sky from the tower at the academy. The windowed eye unfurls, revealing muscly sinew, and the man, it's not an eye but a mouth, fit to eat God's flesh, and I have brought his jaws down upon me, I… End log. Mission status. Failure. Agent lost. Immediately following the conclusion of Recon 661.3, Agent Vuong entered into a catatonic state. She was transferred to Site-008, where she perished after three days of intensive care. Autopsy of the body revealed the cause of death were from heart and lung failure due to swelling of the inner brain. The swelling was caused by teratoma tumors comprised of optic nerve endings on the stem of the brain. Consequently, the lethality rating of the RPC-661 has been upgraded to orange. Dr. Meridak has also concluded that testing of XD-N01 must not last longer than four hours at a time, and tests must be performed no more than once per week. Further testing documentation has been upgraded to Level 3 clearance and above. Containment protocols have been updated to reflect these findings. Office of Anomaly Experimentation 661.4 Department Research Date August 9, 19 Subject XD-N01 Authorization 3C and 3R Staff Dr. Hansik Dr. Meridak Agent Boucher Test Purpose Agent Boucher has been chosen as Agent Buong's replacement due to his experience as an avid lucid dreamer. He has been tasked with making contact with RPC-661-365, who is believed to reside in the Swatswald Bell Tower. Begin Log I taste the salty air. My clothes feel damp, and I am on a noxious pier. The waxing tide eases my anxious mind. The Black Sea is low, revealing its naked body. A series of ancient corpses along the ground, washed away but not forgotten, untouched by rot. Luminescent maggots slither among the various carcasses of unidentifiable creatures, eating what dissolution cannot. The woods behind me give way to the grotesque city. My neck strains to gauge the size of the monolithic cathedrals and spires, and higher still the black sun sits, waned in comparison to the growing city below. It keeps growing eating at the void around itself. The lost sun, once mighty, is a dead meal to a blind animal. Was it ever a god, or just a lion titan? His lumbering breasts and beating hearts underscored by the tower. Swatswald reaches up to the diminished repast. I am in the city now, and hardly a second has passed as I traveled. I can feel its hunger around me, an eye for the cosmos. No, a mouth in the skies. The buildings and bodies of the native cast here are as one, hundreds of voices harmonizing together, comprising the roar of the perfect beast, bodies conjoined and subdued to one will only. A section of the adjacent alleyway catches my eye. A familiar mix of clean grays and whites conspicuously blends with its surroundings. Textless signs appear as I remember them. Site 002? Not a doubt in my mind as I cautiously traverse the alleyway's contents quickly shifting from rock and wood to metal. Her voice bleeds into my mind momentarily. A sleeping colleague. I remember? I bend my will against the curiosity before me, as I must not let it devour me. 
My goal still looms overhead. Schwarzwald. My destination is the mouth of this world, so I follow its breath. The wind pushing and pulling its way to the apex guides me. The world shifts around me, a perjurer to my ambition. I challenge the egregore and make myself seen. The path attempts to lead me to ruin, to the stomach, to the bones of its foundation. I press forward still. The breeze becomes a black downpour at the base, accompanied by Esker rain. The gutters of the streets are vast as rivers, scattered by over blood and bile. The tower itself extends far beyond my capacity to see at such proximity. The simple sight of it gives me conniptions. I cast my view downward as I reach for the door. As my fingers brush the ornate embossing, I surge with revelation. The tower hides behind a fleshy coat, not of its own making, but as a new face. It is a sunken anchor here, the cornerstone of this world, and yet the icor of his deceit. He eats away at it, unwilling to acknowledge the ebbing of its footing. I cast open the doors and enter the main hall, except it is unrecognizable to me now. A barren antique stone structure with stairs leading both up and down. Streaks of parasitic veins run from the entryway, reaching to the floors below, fracturing an endemic base. The wild flood lays stagnant on the floor, high enough to hide my lower legs from me. It flows freely from the ceiling and the upper stairwell. Fully aware, he floods the lower levels. An audacious invitation upwards. I pray my keepers to prepare their efforts to rest me from this nightmare. The morning sun. I do not know what host will stand before me. His unified wills rest atop this ilum. I parallel his ascension in only the most minute manners. Can this be a man anymore? I pass quickly upward still, struggling to ignore the host of visions each floor offers me. A group of phantoms brandishing the triangle, wishing to understand the nature of eyes, spirals hopelessly against the infinite, only several stages up. They are a picture painted a thousand times over, with only the slightest variations. Some of them adorn themselves in blue capes, others are fleeing a burning world. Yet others still press onwards in the pursuit of untold knowledge. I am one of them, varied only slightly by my host's gracious call. Dr. Meridak prepares a syringe of epinephrine at the believed request of Agent Boucher. On-site medical personnel have suggested that a potent stimulant may resuscitate subject immediately following their entry into a catatonic state. Higher still, I enter a floor covered in a red mist. The sound of beating wings fills the air. I strain to see the Allery creature before me, but my focus shifts as the ground beneath me begins to crack and wane. I flee from the rampant destruction beneath me, only just making my way to the stairwell as the floor buckles and breaks. Impatient of my time here, he opens the passageway past the never-ending floors. I just make it to his archway as a deafening crash is heard below. The red fog turns to a burning blue as I slam the door shut behind me. I now stand at the foyer of the Sepulchre of Impidoc, his name no more. Hordes of faithful disciples prostrate themselves before the Torrid. They are a mix of students of the Academy, phantoms from below and weak spirits, to lowly even to become part of the body of the dream. Their foreheads touch the floor, creating pools of the veiny flood from below. They are like an arm stretching beneath the archway towards their sovereign lord. I enter the precipice. In the center of the room stands a man. The eye of the nightmare sees all from here. It is unchallenged. Streaks from the dead sun leak through the roof and leach into the floor. They move past the stagnant waters that plague this incubus. Does he notice me? Glory be to he, the new god. His head is wrapped in bandages, old wounds and stained dressings. The swelling of his mind presses against his headpiece. Vestigial mouths and eyes wrap around the copper bars, corroding their restraints. The pupils of the eyes split again and again until they are like stars. Several vertical rungs burst upward from his girth, forming what appears to be a cracked crown. The nature of his being contorts. Frail extensions of the arms, fingers and torso make him a polypheme. Still unable to control the eyes, he turns to me with a gaze so dominant I fall to my knees before him. He slithers his way towards me, 
The lower end of his stomach distends into a black pustular tumor, with bones and wet sickly growths extending past its form. The perversion of the snake. A slug. Blasphemy. Agent Boucher begins to experience an intense increase in rim effects. Dr. Meridak injects him with the epinephrine. I cannot be here. The voices of thousands enter my head, the chorus led by the mouth and eye. Their presence is so heavy my features turn in on themselves, as if the individual points of my being sense the looming demise. My footing is adrift in the i and I am a meal to him, another brick in the new world. He knows I wake. The corpse of the Black Sun sees my blight. Within his visage, there is a true world. The morning light breaks the eternal night. Interloper, and I have been whisked away. End log. Mission status success. Agent Boucher's speech mannerisms vary sporadically from his baseline self immediately following his entry into the dream space. Dr. Meridak has theorized that distinct individuals may be more susceptible to the bleed-through subconscious effects of XD-01, or that its effects are growing in strength and intensity. All subsequent testing of RPC-661-XD-01 has been disbanded following Recon 661.4. Due to its supposed ability to assimilate the minds of its inhabitants, Authority personnel categorized it as a possible Class V higher dimensional entity. See Addendum 661-03 for further details. Warning: The following file is restricted to Level 4 personnel. The continuation of this document has been restricted to Level 4 personnel and above by the order of Dr. Mason of Site-074. Personnel caught accessing this document without proper authorization may be subjected to immediate apprehension and administered A2 amnestics. You have been warned. Addendum 661-03 Incident 66101-N01 Following the ban on anomaly experimentation with an XD-N01, Uniform 01's Agent Boucher have been reassigned to various other anomalies within the northern United States. Approximately two months after his expedition into the dream space, on September 22, 19, Authority personnel intercepted a distress call from Agent Boucher's personal radio. After initially failing to make contact with the agent, a recovery team was dispatched to his last known location. Incident Report 66101-N01 Recovery teams were dispatched to the Hotel in New York following Boucher's distress call. The hotel staff have received several noise complaints involving screaming and various other nondescript noises prior to the authorities' intervention. Once in his room, recovery teams discovered the agent's body among several info-hazardous inscriptions. Catalogued below are some of the recovered notes found alongside the inscriptions. I have been pulled in again, back to this nightmare, back to the Holy Land. I know I am not in the waking world, but I am unable to control any aspect of my dream. Helplessly, I play the familiar role of the scribe. Swatswald. He is bent down almost kneeling to see me. Info had her to symbol omitted. How has he found me here? He is weaker than in the school, but I am dwarfed by comparison. The world wraps around itself so that I cannot escape. I hear the prayers of his congregation overpowering my thoughts, yet I am not alone. Other travelers, new to this world are beside me, pulled below the ocean of black, down into the stomach. He stops. He recognizes me from before. Silent and blind, he lets me struggle. I am nothing to his holy presence. My will is nothing as his mute voice wraps around the inside of my skull. I must atone for my sins. Atone! Empo had her symbol omitted. He knows now what I know, and as I join the congregation below, and sets his eyes on the three pillars, the sky is now full of husks, black suns to act as our feast. Let the feast begin! Various other inscriptions could be found on the walls of the room and inside the pages of the nightstand's bible. These inscriptions are currently indecipherable based on the condition of the writing and the language of the text. Autopsy of the body revealed a cause of death similar to Agent Vuong's. However, Agent Boucher had inoculated his eyes at some point during the incident. 
Due to the events of Incident 66101-N01, X-Ray 06 began monitoring reports of other sleep-related deaths on the night of September 22, 19. They discovered an increase of approximately 1,000% of SADS and SIDS cases at the time of the incident. Standard case study rates did not appear to normalize for another 13 days following the event. Reclassification of RPC-661 to Omega-Red is currently pending approval.